Okay, let's look at slat abnormalities. You know, suppose during the process of deconfiguration after takeoff or reconfiguration on approach, you go asymmetric on your slats and all the slats are out, let's say, on the right wing and they're all in on the left, as an example. If they're all out on the right wing, you now have a high lift wing, don't you? So the plane's going to roll, isn't it? And as it starts to roll to that high lift wing, you're going to come up with yoke. And if yoke isn't doing a real good job at stopping this roll, what will? The rudder, sure. We come in with a rudder, we can stop the roll. We come in with some more rudder, we can roll it out. We come in with some more rudder, we can get our yoke level. And then we say, what happened? Oh, we got slat asymmetry. Great. Let's get out the checklist. Treat it. But we flew the plane first. Let's look at flap abnormalities. There's several of these out here, but you know, I'm going to tell one about us. I'm going to tell a story about American Airlines here. The reason I'm going to tell a story about American Airlines is because it's going to lead into some things we're going to talk about this afternoon. This issue of automation dependency, you know. Where was it, you know, 15 years ago or so where we started talking more and more about automation and we more and more started focusing on buttons to push to fix an errant flight path or typewriters to type in or switches to move or levers to reposition rather than flying the plane? See? Because it, it started, it wasn't our fault, the whole industry embraced it, and we just went down the road with everybody. And, 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 uh, but it definitely crept in. Let me give you an example. The example relates to, in this case, inboard flap asymmetry. Ten years ago, when I, I was a 767 check airman, we had no 757s in American Airlines at that time. And then nine years ago, we got our first 757. Uh, airplane was coming, and before we got the airplane, we got a CAE simulator for the 757. Well, you know, as Czech airmen, uh, corporately, we view that, that simulator as a toy. I mean, you know, we, find, we jump in there, we want to find out how it flies, and then we want to push every single fault button in the simulator, see what happens, and how you deal with it, you know. So corporately, our, sim our Czech airman group is doing that very thing with this new 757 simulator when they come to a button that says inboard flap asymmetry. So they push it. Okay. And when they push it, what happens in the simulator is the right inboard flap goes down and the left one doesn't. And they find out something very interesting. On a 757, this is an eye-watering roll. It is the worst rolling fault for asymmetry I know of of any in our, our fleet aircraft. And when you come up with the yoke, it doesn't even slow down. Say, well, watch what I just did there. Okay. We call Boeing Aircraft Company and we say, hey, Boeing, do you know that when you have an inboard flap asymmetry on a 7.5, this guy really goes for a trip? And Boeing says, well, yes, that would be true, but that can't happen. <laughs> we have blockers and doofers and ding fang doos right in here. And they're not going to let those flaps split. And we went, really? So then we had a meeting. I'm talking corporately. You know, there's no individuals here. Corporately, we have a meeting, and, and we say, well, what are we going to do? This is the worst rolling fault we've seen for asymmetry. This won't slow it down. There's no button you can push that we know of, you know, or thing you can type in that will stop this. You'd actually have to fly the plane. And, 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 and Boeing says it can't happen. So you know what we did? we decided to remove it from the simulator. That's right. That was our corporate decision. Since there was no button you could push and nothing you could type in and no lever you could move that would stop this thing, we said, let's don't spend any time teaching our pilots fly planes for automation managers, just move it out. That's how we were thinking. That's how we had started to think. See? And so, what happens next? Well, as you know, three years ago, three and a half years ago now, out there in the real world, Boeing 757, other companies, two of them, one on the ground, one in flight, the thing that can't happen, happened. <laughs> Inboard, flap trip, symmetry. And the guy in flight, what happens is the right flap goes down, and what I told you before, he can't even slow it down with the yoke, okay? Now, this captain does do something intuitively correct. I agree with what he did. He takes the flap handle and moves it back from whence it came. Okay, that's good stuff. And fortunately, the flap that was going down comes back up. 
So as he holds the yoke like this, the plane kind of dishes out like that. All right. Now what do we do at American Airlines? Well, we see, of course, our safety net picks up on the fact that the thing that can't happen is happening. And we get real excited. We go, gosh, we've got to tell all our 7576 pilots about this. They've got to know. So we put a whole bunch of pink bulletins together very hurriedly to launch them out to all you guys and gals saying, hey, the thing that can't happen is happening. But do you remember what we said in that pink bulletin to do if it happens to you? Do I remember? You may not have been on the fleet then. What we said in the pink bulletin to do if this happens, we said, move the flap lever back from whence it came. A mechanical fix. Do you see a problem here? Does anybody see a problem? I mean, the plane's rolling, you come up with this and you move the flap handle back. I mean, yeah. What happens if the flap doesn't come back up? Well, then just die like a man. <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, what are you whining about? <laughs> you know, I think all you guys and gals know where I'm going with this, and I, I think you understand the point. What, what should we have done eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, when we realized what a terrible rolling fault this was? What should we really have done? And I think you all agree what we should really done is, if you find out that this yoke won't stop this plane from rolling, what will? Rudder. Even with this fault, if you come in with rudder, you can stop the roll. And if you come in with some more rudder, you can roll it out. And if you come in with some more rudder all the way to the floor, in this case, with the rudder, you will just get your yoke off the stop. That's how bad it is. But you've got it. You've got it. You're under control. And then you identify the problem and you treat it. But you fly the plane first. But eight years ago, we had already started to drift away from that philosophy. Okay. Um, let's go into the pitch uh, issue. Uh, let's go away from the roll axis and look at the pitch axis, okay? We've got, let's talk about stabilizer stuff for a minute. Unscheduled or jammed. You might be interested in knowing that unscheduled stabilizer accounts for four hull losses and 282 deaths in this time frame that we're concerned with. What is unscheduled stabilizer trim? Well, remember back in the 7-2 Asaurus, the Jurassic jet? Uh, unscheduled, oh, you're some of you are still there. So, remember, this, unscheduled stabilizer trim was obvious to the most casual observer, wasn't it? <laughs> right? I mean, that, yeah, that big old wheel down there, right, spinning around, clanging and banging, right, in a manly way, you're supposed to put your hand on it, bring it to a stop, right, you know, or grab the co-pilot's knee and jam her knee in the other side. <laughs> Everybody knew what was going on, didn't they, see? But you see what killed those 282 people is a very insidious event. Because today in a highly modern automated airliner, unscheduled stab trim is essentially unseen and unheard. But it's happening. Let me give you my definition of unscheduled stabilizer trim in a highly automated airliner. This is a little convoluted, but listen. The stabilizer is currently running in a direction that is opposite to the way the pilot flying would intuitively believe it to be going. You get it? Usually to an autopilot command, but sometimes to a fault. Let's look at one of those accidents. This is an Airbus A300-600R approaching the Goya Airport. It's the exact same airplane that American Airlines flies, behaves essentially like any of the airplanes built this way. Okay? He's coming in to land at Nagoya, it's visual, he has the field in sight, the co-pilot's flying, he has the auto throttles on and the autopilot off. He's trying to hand fly and he's coming on in and he's got the ILS tuned up so he can get the glide slope, which is great, and he has the field in sight. As he starts to work onto the glide slope, he has a little trouble with his glide path control. Okay? And as he has more and more trouble getting stabilized on the path, he does something that we see automation-dependent pilots doing more and more. 
He goes, you know, I don't fly much. I'm not very good at this anymore. He goes, autopilot, would you help me with this? But then he goes, no, 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 I can do it. I can do it. And he goes back to hand flying. And now he's hand flying the airplane coming in. What he doesn't know, though, is in fact there is an autopilot engaged by his action. So as he continues to fly the airplane, neither he nor the captain knowing an autopilot's engaged, they think they're hand flying. They're coming down to land. He gets his glide path under control, gets things kind of stabilized here. And then one of the two pilots, they don't know which one, accidentally nicks that toga bar on the auto throttles right in front of the throttles there and puts it into the go around mode. And, the, and this guy's still coming in to land. Well, since he's coming in to land, the co-pilot, and the autopilot's on, and it sees a toga command, the autopilot goes, well, gee, this guy's got the elevator and the throttles. How am I going to go around? So then the autopilot goes, oh, I know. Yeah, I'll go around with the stabilizer. So the autopilot starts running the stabilizer toward nose up in an attempt to go around. The first officer who's flying, see, he's coming in to land. And so as he comes in to land, as you might imagine, he's having to push farther and farther forward on the yoke because of this stab trim run. And as that disparity gets great enough, that conversation in the cockpit starts. And all you guys and gals know this conversation between the captain and the co-pilot. You know the one that goes, what is, why is, how come is? Well, that's going on in the cockpit as this thing's running. And finally, it comes to a stop within one degree of full up because that's autopilot limit. At about the same time, the first officer hits what is essentially full nose down elevator limit. So they're even. <laughs> and they're still coming in to land, see? Well, then another neat thing occurs. The auto throttles, uh, without telling the whole story, the auto throttles are, are commanded to be engaged, and they engage into the go around mode. When they engage into the go around mode, the throttles go flying forward, right? When the throttles go flying forward, what do they say that would do to the pitch axis of an airplane like this? Sure, I see all your hands doing it before I even said it. The, air, the airplane starts up. Well, does he have any more elevator left to deal with that? He's already used that, hasn't he? So now, He's holding the elevator full forward, but the thrust vector is bringing the nose up and up and up. The captain gets on the yoke, and he's pushing full forward on the yoke, and the nose keeps coming up. This goes on for the longest time. Think about this, guys and gals. They're both holding the yoke full forward, and it goes on and it goes on and on. Neither one of them has any idea what to do with this. It keeps coming up and up and up and up and up. Finally, it runs out of energy up in here, stalls, comes down, tries to lift again, right wing stalls, rolls over onto its back and goes into the ground 80 degrees nose low. I'm going to compare that, since we have our Delta friends here, I'm going to compare that uh, to an incident that occurred with Delta that leads their crew to the exact same problem I think you will agree. However, they deal with it much better. This is a Delta 1011 airplane, an airplane built like this. This will be an example of jammed stabilizer. However, I think you will agree it took the crew to precisely the same problem. They're taxiing out in this 1011 at the San Diego airport here a few years back. We wrote this up in the uh, flight deck. Many of you may remember this. They're taxiing out in this 1011 at the San Diego airport. And as they taxi out, unbeknownst to the crew, the stabilizer runs fully up and jammed. And they would have had no way of knowing that. And it's fully up and jammed now. And as they take the runway, they can't know it because as part of the fault, the stabilizer trim indicator is still in the green takeoff range. Yeah, the plot thickens, doesn't it? So as they taxi onto the runway now, it indicates that they're in the green on takeoff on the stabilizer. And now when the first officer who's going to make the takeoff pushes the throttles up for takeoff, there will be no takeoff warning horn. Because as you know, the horn is tied to the indicator, not the stabilizer. So they go roaring down the runway with no warning. And the airplane, of course, starts to rotate early. And the first officer does what I think I would have done, probably. He goes, you know, he goes, you know, come on, stop that. I'm not ready for that yet. And he pushes forward on the yoke. But the plane rotates some more. So he goes, come on, stop that. And the plane rotates and lifts off at the same time he hits full forward yoke. They're airborne with full forward yoke, and they're not even at rotation speed yet. Ooh, right. From here on, it looks a whole lot like Nagoya. Now, by the way, the captain, to his credit, is on the voice recorder already trying to run the stabilizer trim, which I don't think I'd have thought of it that fast, but it doesn't matter that it wasn't going to move. It was jammed. 
So they're holding full forward on the stick, the first officer is, and here comes the nose. It's coming up. It's coming up. Quick, somebody help. Is this unusual? <laughs> is it nose high or nose low? What should I do? Help me, quick. Yes, roll, yes. And the captain takes over the airplane, says, I've got it and rolls the airplane to a nose high unusual attitude recovery procedure that I promise you he was taught by someone somewhere. Because when you roll a lift vector off regardless of what is wrong with an airplane, the nose is coming down. He applies that procedure, he gets the nose coming down, he rolls back up and she just clears Point Loma out off San Diego, you know, the ridge. And she's back in the climb again, of course, because the fault is still in there. So he goes up to another nose high unusual attitude recovery, and then he goes up to another nose high unusual attitude recovery, and goes up to another nose. He corkscrews out over the Pacific Ocean, doing one nose high unusual attitude recovery after another. Finally, he gets enough altitude below him where he thinks he can start dealing with this problem. And besides, everyone is puking. <laughs> So he starts, he starts saying, okay, what am I going to do with this horrible pitch problem? With an airplane built like this, what's the first thing you'd go to for a horrible pitch problem? Exactly. Thrust vector effect. And he does. He pulls one and three to idle. He jams number two to max. And bang, he overcomes a full-up stabilizer. And he regains normal pitch control. Just one problem. Not enough total thrust. <laughs> Headed back for the ocean, okay? So he has to come back in on one and three. So he leaves number two and max. He eases back in on one and three until he finally gets enough total thrust to stop sinking. Now his airplane's back to doing this, but not nearly as violently as it was before, okay? And then he says, well, what else can I do to deal with this pitch problem? He thinks about it for a minute. He says, oh, I know. I'll move the center of gravity. So he picks up the mic and he says, free drinks in first class. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody in the back runs to the front, okay? You get them all up front, and guess what? He gets this puppy down to a pretty nice little damp, okay? Now, I'm going to stop right there because this story takes too long to tell in, all, in its entirety. But let me go on to say that this captain goes on and does several clever things that every pilot in this room would think of given time. And he recovers this airplane in a very boogered configuration, successfully at the Los Angeles airport. All right? Sure. <laughs> Whoever he is, he just got applause. The, uh, uh, the point here is, that I want to make, and I think you guys and gals get it, is what's the difference between Nagoya, the outcome at Nagoya, and the outcome at San Diego. Training. Because see, right here, right here, few of us, certainly not I, are clever enough because there isn't time to be clever. A critical flight attitude recovery requires training and rote response because there isn't time to think. You must respond to the training. And it's that response to that training, that initial move, that saves the initial crisis, that buys the time to do all the clever things that we'll all think of given time. Buy into that? <laughs>